Hello and welcome to the first video of the Basics of Audio Technology training series. This video is going to be going over Chapter 1, the Basics of Sound. But if you haven't watched the introductory video, please stop and go watch that so you can get a copy of the book and understand how this series works. But without further ado, here we go, the Basics of Sound. So I always start with the question, what is sound? I get a lot of varied responses, but typically it ends up being what you hear and sound through the air. But sound can travel through anything. It can travel through gases, liquids, and solids. And in short, sound is just energy that causes molecules to vibrate. It's energy that causes vibrations. And so when we're thinking about sound in the air, think about molecules all being around you. When energy hits them, they're going to move. And if you can see on page three, figure one, uh, let's call this an air molecule just standing at its place of rest, so at equilibrium. When energy hits that, when I speak and introduce energy into the air, that molecule is going to move, go back to the other side, and then back to its place of rest. It's going to do it a couple of times, and then due to friction, it's going to come back to its place of rest here in the center. So sound is the cyclical displacement of molecules in an elastic or compressible medium. So again, it could be gases, liquids, or solids. Now the rate at which the molecules move back and forth is dependent on the elasticity or compressibility of the medium. And so that rate is what we call the frequency. And when it completes one full cycle, going back and forth to each side and back to the middle, that's called the period. And so we can measure that in uh, hertz is what we use. And that's how many cycles per second. Now the amplitude is a little different. The amplitude is how far does it move from center, not how quickly. Amplitude is determined by how much energy is introduced into the system. Amplitude dictates how far it's going to move, and that's also the loudness when it comes to sound. Frequency is how fast it moves, and that dictates the pitch at which the sound emanates from that medium. And so we're going to stop here and go to an example, two examples. The first is the Newton's cradle, just to show energy moving through different mediums, but this one, just steel. And then we're going to see another one showing... Um, a tone generator to show the difference in frequency and amplitude. Here we have Newton's cradle, but we're not going to be talking about the laws of motion. I'm simply using it to give you a visual of energy transferring through a medium. In our case, I want you to imagine that these steel balls are air molecules. When we talk, our vocal cords vibrate and create air pressure waves. We are introducing energy into the air, and that energy passes through the air molecules. So again, if these steel balls are air molecules, they are currently at rest in a state of equilibrium. When we talk, we introduce energy into the system. The energy transfers through them and continues on. This won't go on forever due to friction. Eventually, the energy will slowly reduce to nothing and these balls will return to equilibrium or until something stops it. The more energy I introduce, the larger the displacement of the molecules from equilibrium or the greater the amplitude. You can look at, a f at figure one on page three for a diagram of this. When it comes to sound, the greater the amplitude or more energy is equivalent to a louder sound and less amplitude means a quieter sound. So let's see if you can hear the difference. That was a lot of in energy introduced and here's just a little bit. Now, when a molecule moves from its state of rest or equilibrium to max displacement on either side and then back again to equilibrium, that total motion completes a cycle and is referred to as the period. You can see this on figure three on page six. The amount of time that it takes to complete a full cycle determines the frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch and vice versa. Now in the Newton's cradle, we have a fixed frequency. So I'm gonna show you frequency changes in the next example. We will also talk about how we measure frequency. Lastly, you'll notice that when the balls are moving, there's areas where they move very little and areas where they move a lot. In a sound wave, the areas where they move very little is called compression, and the areas where they move a lot is called rarefaction. You can, all those, you can also see this on figure three on page six. In this example, I'm gonna be demonstrating the difference between frequency and amplitude. Here I have a sine wave generator. I'm going to play a 110 hertz frequency tone. 
Now, sound per frequency is measured in hertz, which is how many cycles completed per second. So here we're going to play 110 cycles in one second, which is also known as an A note. You can see it here on the oscilloscope. As I increase the frequency, you'll see more cycles completed and the pitch will increase. Now as I increased it, you'll notice that the amplitude does not change. The volume of the sound does not change. It stays the same throughout. When, the amplitude only changes when I increase the energy. So I'm going to turn it up on the scope only, not your ears. And you'll see the amplitude increased. It's now louder. When I change the frequency, the amplitude stays the same. Amplitude and frequency are independent of each other. Frequency determines the pitch of the sound and amplitude determines the volume of the sound. And that is the difference between frequency and amplitude. All right, so hopefully those videos give you a good idea of how energy transfers through various mediums and also the difference between frequency and amplitude. It's important to note that the speed of sound changes through different mediums. So the speed of sound is much slower in gases than it is in water, and water is much slower than it is in solids. Uh, on table one of page five of the book, you can see there the different speeds of sound through various mediums. It's very important to note the speed of sound in air, and we'll talk about that later on in this chapter. But for now, we're gonna talk about sound in air. How does sound travel through the air? So if we go to page um, six, figure three, you'll see here what you're most commonly see is just a graphical representation of a wave. This is not actually how sound moves through the air. Sound doesn't move in this S-like pattern as it travels. It actually moves like this up here in the form of a longitudinal or compression wave. Below this transverse wave is just a graphical representation of what's happening in a compression wave. So we're going to stop here and go to an example that shows the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves using a slinky. In this example, I'm going to be demonstrating the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves, as well as demonstrating how density changes the speed of energy moving through a medium. So in this case, the speed of sound through something. First, I'm going to start with a transverse wave. That's the one we're most familiar with. Transverse wave is when the direction of the energy is moving perpendicular to the direction of the wave. So I'm going to introduce energy in this direction, and the wave is moving in that direction. That is a transverse wave. A longitudinal wave is when the energy is moving parallel to the direction of the wave. So I'm going to introduce energy in this direction, and the wave is also moving in that direction. So again, transverse wave and longitudinal wave. And remember, sound waves are longitudinal waves, or also known as compression waves. Now I'm going to demonstrate on the slinky how density changes the speed of the wave. So the elasticity of the spring is constant. So if I move it this way, it becomes more dense, but the elasticity stays the same. So you, I'm going to show a transverse wave. You can see the wave moving at that relatively slow speed. Now, if I stand it farther back, I decrease the density. That wave is moving much faster. So the more dense a material, the slower sound will go through it. And the less dense a material, the faster sound will go through it but that is also in relation to its elastic coefficient. So it's not true for everything. There are very dense materials in which sound travels very quickly, but that the main difference is its elastic coefficient. And so that is the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves and how density changes the speed of sound. All right, so hopefully that example of the Sleem Geeve gives you a good idea of the difference between longitudinal and transverse waves and just how sound moves through the air. 
And next, we're going to be moving on to page seven of the book. We're going to start talking about complex sounds. So what we have here in figure three is a one, a graphical representation of one single um, frequency. Um, it is a, a sine wave, and that's the purest tone that you can get. It's only one single frequency being played. But that's not what we hear in the world around us. What we hear are a complex just gathering of different sounds all together coming at the same time. And those are complex sound waves. And so they look like what we see here in this graph. It's more than just a single, you know, one pretty line. It's a lot of different waves all mixed together. And so the way that we get um, complex sound waves is having multiple frequencies playing at the same time. Um, and each vibrating body has different modes of vibration. So we're going to use a guitar string as our example here. I'm going to bring up this um, figure. It's on page 8, figure 5. So if you can imagine here, we just have one guitar string. We'll say it's up here. And when we pluck it, what we imagine most of the time happening is that wave, that whole string is just going to vibrate as a whole, as one big whole. But actually, actually what's happening is it's vibrating at a whole, but it's also vibrating in all different sorts of different modes of vibration. Now, modes of vibration are what produce overtones or harmonics to a vibrating body. And what they are are mathematical integers, so multiplied integers of the fundamental frequency. So let's say this whole vibrating string of a guitar vibrates at 100 hertz. This next partial mode of vibration here um, is going to be at 50 hertz, and then so on and so forth. It goes in thirds and fourths and fifths, sixths and sevenths. Um, and as they increase, the amplitude of them also decreases. So it's not just all these frequencies playing at the same loudness. They decrease as the modes increase. And so those different modes of vibration create different overtones. And so different overtones, there's harmonic overtones and inharmonic overtones. Um, harmonic overtones are specifically ones that are pure mathematical integers of the fundamental frequency. Inharmonics would not be pure whole integers such as half thirds. They'd be weird ones all in between. And musical instruments are tailored and designed to produce more harmonic overtones. And then things that aren't designed to make sound, you know, don't really have harmonic overtones. They just produce whatever they do. There are some instruments that are designed for inharmonic overtones. But different modes of vibration create the complex sounds that come out of different vibrating bodies, that the complex sounds that come out of different vocal cords, out of different instruments. And these different sounds are what is known as the timbre. Um, you can see that word on page 8, or also known as the color or quality of the tone. And this is why different instruments playing the same exact note can sound different. So one guitar tuned to the same exact note played versus another guitar tuned to the same exact note, they're going to sound different. And that's because they're not 100% identical, and those strings are not going to vibrate the same way. The bodies of the guitars are not going to resonate the exact same way, and the home overtones that create are not going to be the exact same, so they're going to sound a little different. So what I'm going to do here is now show you an example of a sine wave versus a guitar wave, complex wave, just so that you hear the difference. In this example, I'm going to be demonstrating the difference between a sine wave or pure tone and a complex wave. Here I have a sine generator. It's going to be playing a 110 hertz tone. That is the note A. Then I'm going to be playing a guitar also playing the same note A. These tuners are here just so that you see that they're in tune as best as I can get them. And then you're going to be able to see the sine wave here on the oscillator and the guitar wave here on the oscillator. So here's the sine wave, and here's the guitar. So you can hear similarities because they are playing a fundamental frequency of 110 hertz, but they do not sound the same.
nor do they look the same. So in the oscillator, sine wave is singular wave, and the guitar is many waves in one. And the reason is because of modes of vibration and harmonics. There are many modes of vibration in a vibrating string on a guitar, and not just one mode of vibration, not one frequency vibrating. And those different modes of vibration create harmonics or overtones, which give the sound of the guitar. And that's why this sine wave sounds different from this guitar. Yes, it is the same 110 hertz fundamental frequency, but the guitar contains many other frequencies within it, which give it its distinct sound. And that is the difference between a sine wave and a complex wave. All right, so hopefully that example gives you a really good uh, just picture of the difference between a pure sine wave and then complex sounds. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is resonance. Uh, resonance has to do with um, the same idea of vibrating bodies. So if you pluck a guitar string, that guitar string is going to vibrate, and that vibration sends energy into the air, and that's what causes the sound to hit our ears. But that same energy can interact with other things around it. Um, and when you have the sympathetic vibration of other things around you, that's called resonance. And so I'm going to show an example of resonance here using a piano. Okay, in this example, I'm going to be showing sympathetic vibrations in a piano um, due to resonance. What I'm going to do is hit this lower C while lifting the dampers off the next two octaves of C. When you hold down the keys on a piano, the dampers come up, as you can see in the video. So when I strike the lowest C with these dampers up, they're going to continue to ring sympathetically. And you can hear them stop when I put the dampers down. I'll do it one more time. Not only does it work for full multiple integers of the fundamental frequency, meaning the octaves, it also works for partials. So if I do the third, the fifth, and then the octave again, they will also ring. Again, this is sympathetic vibrations due to resonance. Okay, so hopefully that example provides a good picture of sympathetic resonance, how one vibrating body can transfer energy and sympathetically cause other bodies to vibrate as well. Now, this is very important to remember um, with different instruments and uh, whatever scenario in you are in. A common scenario that I run into is when a bass guitar plays a particular note and then one of the drums starts vibrating. It's particularly noticeable when one of those drums is a snare drum because then you start to get that little sizzle from the snares on the bottom. And if it's a common note that you're going to be playing a lot in a particular song and it always causes the snare drum to sympathetically vibrate, the fix for it is just simply tuning the snare drum up or down just a little bit so that that fundamental frequency of the snare drum is not the same fundamental frequency of that bass guitar. Um, it also happens with other instruments, other string bodies, so one guitar can cause another one to sympathetically vibrate. And if it's turned up and not muted, that can cause itself to start sympathetically vibrating and it might hear itself in a monitor and then cause interference. Um, also, resonance can also work within specific spaces. So if you're playing music out of speakers and the dimensions of a room from wall to wall uh, line up with the same uh, measurement of a frequency wave, uh, typically lower frequency waves, that frequency can be boosted in the room. And so all of a sudden you're wondering why is a certain frequency louder than all the other frequencies in this room and it can wreak havoc for sound engineers. But there's ways to fix that, which we'll get onto much later. Um, but going back to feedback, the reason you have feedback is because of acoustical phase. And so our next section that we're going to talk about is acoustical phase. Okay, so acoustical phase. So phase indicates a particular point or position in a cycle, because remember sound is cyclical. There's a point of rest that moves to both sides and then back to the middle that can be measured in angles of degrees. 
And so if we go to our figure here again, we see the wave. Um, we can just imagine, we know that this is one full cycle. This is one full cycle from zero to the end. So if we were to measure that as phase, we would call this zero and 360 degrees. So if we saw that in a circular pattern, we would start here, go all the way around, and it would be 360 degrees, we'd repeat. So looking at a wave um, as measured in, as angles and degrees, we start with zero, 45, 90, 135, 180, 225, 270, 315, and 360 degrees. And so this is very important because when different waves interact with each other um, at different points in their phasing, especially if they're at the same, well, they, they have to be at the same frequency, um, then you're going to have constructive or destructive interference. And you can't necessarily label constructive interference as good or bad or destructive as good and bad. Um, there's a combination of both, and it really is your scenario. Not all of it's always going to be good all the time or bad all the time, but it's very important to understand how it works. And so on page 9, figure 6 that we'll see here, we have a graphical representation of constructive interference on part A and destructive interference um, B, and then a mix of both in C. So for simple, for simplicity, uh, we're just using one sine wave, and we see here that it's perfectly in line with the second wave. Now this is positive one and positive one. One plus one equals two. We have negative one and negative one. Negative one plus negative one equals negative two. So when waves, sound waves are perfectly in phase with each other, you have constructive interference, which doubles the amplitude. Now, when they're perfectly out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase, we're going to have positive 1 plus negative 1 equals 0. And negative 1 plus positive 1 also equals 0, and all the way up and down through these entire measurements. So you're going to have 100% destructive interference. And then 90 degrees out of phase or anywhere in between, you're going to have a mix of both. There's going to be addition and subtractive, constructive and destructive, and it's going to shift the phase a little bit, maybe make it a little quieter overall or louder overall. It just depends on what scenario you're in. So I'm going to stop now and go to an example where you can hear constructive and destructive interference with sine waves. In this example, I'm going to be showing phasing and how you, with phasing you have destructive and constructive interference. Here I've recorded a 500 hertz sine wave, then I duplicated it and put it in phase, which means the periods match up, completes the cycle in the exact same time, and the peaks and dips are in the same orientation. Then I put it 180 degrees out of phase, which means it completes the cycle 180 degrees differently, which means it, it completes its cycle here rather than here. And the peaks and dips are in opposite orientations. Then I put it 90 degrees out of phase, so it completes the cycle there rather than here, and the peaks and dips are off. On the oscilloscope, you're going to see the first in phase 500 hertz tone here, and then all the others here. And then in the middle, there's going to be addition or subtraction of the two. So here is the first 500 hertz tone. And I'm going to zoom out so it doesn't cause any issues with crashing. Then I'm going to add in the in-phase wave. And as you can hear, it got louder. And visibly, you can see that the amplitude increased as well. This is without it. And increased amplitude. And the reason is, let's say this was positive 1. This is also positive 1. 1 plus 1 equals positive 2. Now let's try it 100, oh, let's try 90 degrees out of phase. It got just a little bit louder. Turn it off and on. You can see it. Um, but it did cause the peaks and dips to be off a little bit of it. Now let's see it 180 degrees out of phase. You should be able to hear nothing. Um, but as you can see on the oscilloscope, we still see just a little bit, but it's so quiet that we can't hear it in our headphones.
And that's because, again, let's say that this is positive 1, this is negative 1. 1 plus negative 1 equals 0. So we have 100% destructive interference due to phase cancellation. And here we have 100% constructive interference due to phase addition. And then with the 90 degrees out of phase, we have a mix of both. Some frequency, some are getting canceled out, some are being added together, but it equals out to about the same thing, just slightly louder. And that is how phasing works. Um, and so just remember, constructive and destructive interference is a very real thing, um, and you will experience it out there. So hopefully that gives you a very accurate picture of constructive and destructive interference. And yes, there are times in the physical real world at which you will run into destructive interference where some frequencies are just completely gone or some frequencies are completely boosted way beyond other frequencies. Um, so it's very important to remember phase, specifically when using two sources of um, sound capture or sound playback. So if you have two speakers, depending on where the speakers are in the room and how sound reflects off of things, you're gonna have points at which there's gonna be constructive or destructive interference all over the place. And so proper placement of speakers within a room can help mitigate those problems. Also when using multiple microphones. So if you have a microphone close to a sound source and far away from a sound source, the sound is gonna hit one microphone at one point and the other at one point, but in the recording, they come at the same point. And, but physically, those sound waves are gonna be out of phase from each other. So when you listen to it in the recording, you're gonna have a mix of constructive and destructive interference. So it's very important to time align microphones so that they're in phase with each other so you don't have those phasing problems. Um, drum kits are probably the worst for mic phasing issues because if you think of one instrument that has the most amount of microphones it's almost always the drums and if uh, and you always have multiple parts of the drums at different spacings and you have multiple microphones so phasing is always an issue so typically with drums you want to pick one center point as your measurement reference and then have all the microphones time delayed from that center point to make them phase aligned um, and the best way to remember and time delay is remembering that sound travels at different speeds through different mediums, and in air, tra tra sound travels roughly about one millisecond per foot is what you can do for your time delay. And that's a very important number to remember, one millisecond per foot. So if you have microphones that are multiple feet apart, do the math, and then you can delay per foot. Um, there's also great tools online that you can use as calculators to figure that out. Um, and so now we're gonna move on to our next section of physical interaction of sound waves. So the physical interaction of sound waves, it's very important to understand how sound waves interact with the world around us. As we've already talked about with phasing, um, phase issues can be caused by the interactions of sound waves around us. For instance, I'm talking into a microphone Sound is also bouncing off my computer and reaching the microphone at a different time, which can cause it to be in a different phase, which we have constructive or destructive interference. And so understanding how sound works is very important. So I'm going to go over the different five different ways that sound interacts um, with the world around us. So on page 12, oh, sorry, on page 10 of the book, figure seven, we have the five different ways that sound uh, interacts around us. We're going to start here with diffusion. Sound moves in all areas. So me talking, sound does not solely go in this one direction. If there were somebody in the back of the room, they would be able to hear me. Even if I had a 100% of absorption foam in front of me, they would still be able to hear me talking because sound goes in all directions. Not only is sound coming through my voice, it's also my body is resonating with this vibration and it's kind of emanating for me as a whole, but for the most part, it's coming out of my mouth, but it still goes in all directions. 
So that is diffusion. Sound goes in all directions. The next is reflection, which most of you are probably most familiar with. If you've ever been, a, been in a cave or been at the Grand Canyon or something like that, you've heard an echo. An echo is just reflection of sound. Sound has traveled a great distance, reflected off a bunch of stuff, and come right back at you. When I'm talking here, again, sound is reflecting off my computer screen and back to you. The next is absorption. Um, sound moves in all directions and then also gets absorbed. It gets stopped by things. The best absorber um, of sound is something that's soft, that's uh, porous, that's big as well. Um, so foam is a good one. Uh, hard surfaces are the best, sur best surfaces for reflection. So softer uh, mediums or surfaces are better for absorption. Hard surfaces like glass are the most reflective. Now the next is we have uh, diffraction here that uh, sound waves can change direction and spread after passing through things. Um, the definition of diffraction is the bending or spreading of sound waves as they pass an object. So diffraction happens um, when we're talking, you know, down a hallway and somebody hears you in a room. Sound waves are reflecting, but then also bending into rooms. Um, when we think of waves such as antenna waves for radio waves, um, waves bend over the tops of mountains so sometimes in the valleys you don't get good reception because those waves aren't diffracting enough over the object but sometimes they do um if i were trying to keep out the noise in the room next to me i want to shut the door all the way because even if i leave it just a little bit cracked the sound is still going to come through and move in all directions and change speed and changing speed goes to the next one called refraction um, refraction is really cool, uh, and I'll put a link to a video in the description here along with other videos for different things. Um, refraction can bend sound waves due to um, the change in speed through different mediums. So in air, when you have cold air, hot air, below or above, sound waves can physically bend. So at, in the daytime, if you're on one end of a field and your friend is on the other, you try to yell to them, you may not be able to hear them well, but at night you can hear them crystal clear. And that's due to refraction because the change in temperature, the change in density of the molecules can change the speed of air. Um, also, sound traveling through objects can also change the speed. So me talking here is not going to sound the same as if you were listening on the other side of the wall. That's because there's been absorption, reflection, but then most of all, refraction through that medium. And so those are the five different types of physical interactions of sound waves. But lastly, there's one more. There's a combination of all five of these happening all at once, all the time. Um, there might be more of one than another. Um, like, so for instance, absorption. If you're in a completely foam room, you're going to have way more absorption than you are reflection. But that doesn't mean that none of these are going to happen. So it's very important to remember these five or now six different interactions. Um, and the next thing that we're going to be talking about is how we perceive these interactions. Um, the first way that we perceive it is through direct sound. So I'm talking, sound is going directly to the microphone. The next are early reflections. It's sound that reaches the listener or the microphone between 10 to 20 milliseconds after the direct sound. So early reflections here would be me talking off of my computer screen, off of this wall right here, and then back to the microphone. And the next we have reverberations. Reverberations happen 20 milliseconds and after. And reverberations are the elongation of the initial sound. So if I talk and say, hey, and you hear the decay of the sound, and it just sounds like that hey goes on for a long time, it's because there's a lot of reverberation in this room. And reverb is short for reverberation. So when people ask for the effect, hey, I need more reverb in my monitor, they're asking for a um, fake uh, injected reverberation to make it sound more natural. Because when you're talking into a microphone or you're singing into a microphone, you're about one inch away from it. All you're getting is just pure direct sound. So when you put on your headphones or you're listening through a monitor, all you're hearing is direct sound and it sounds unnatural. So by adding the reverb, uh, reverb effect to it, it makes it sound like it's in a room and makes it sound natural. 
but reverb is also different from echo. Remember, reverb is just the elongation of the initial sound, so it's got a long decay to it. Echo, it has multiple distinct iterations of that sound that repeat. So reverb would be like, hey, and there's a long decay. It has a lot of reverb to it. Echo would be, hey, 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 hey. There's multiple iterations of that. And so that's how we perceive the sound after it's been interacting with the world around us. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the sound envelope and how dynamic changes in sound, how the dynamics change in sound. And that can be broken down into three stages, simply into three stages. Um, when we look at the sound envelope and some of the effects or things that we'll use later, um, it can be broken down into more stages. But at, at its simplest form, there's three stages, attack, sustain, and decay. And that's known as the sound envelope or just envelope. Um, the attack is the start of a sound from its state of rest. So when energy hits it, that's just beginning. Um, decay, or, and then we have sustain. Sustain occurs while energy is still being applied. And then decay is how long it takes for the vibrating system to come back to rest. So if we think of the sound envelope when using an instrument, well, let's, let's use my voice as, as an example. My voice can be an instrument. If I were to say, hey, I put a very quick attack, there's a very short sustain, and then a very quick decay. Just, hey. There was also decay from reverberation in the room, but that's not the sound envelope we're talking about right here. We're talking about just the instrument itself. You can also um, apply the sound envelope to effects like for reverberation, but uh, more often than that, we talk about the sound envelope when referring to instruments. So if I say, hey, again, but I increase the sustain, I say, hey, I kept energy in there. So there was a long sustain the decay was about the same. If I attack and go, hey, the amount of energy up to its loudest point, that was the attack still. Um, and that is the sound envelope. And it's very important to remember these, um, these differences of direct sound, early reflections, reverberation, attack, sustain, and decay um, when you're trying to recreate um, or record sounds. Uh, because you want it to sound natural. This is how sound interacts in the world around us. But if we're recording something at an unnatural distance, you know, one inch from somebody's face, you're not going to get the sound of those physical interactions, and it's going to sound very unnatural. So one fix is that you could put a microphone farther away that can naturally get all of that. Or two, you can do it in post-production by adding effects. And all of those effects have these different settings so that you can recreate it. And if you don't know what each of these are, then you can't properly manipulate those effects to make it sound natural. But there are some cases where you want the effects to sound unnatural. Um, and still, knowing how those things work and how attack, sustain, and decay works can help you achieve that. And so that is uh, the dynamic changes through the sound envelope. That's how the sound interacts with us in the world around us. Um, and the next thing that we're going to talk about is measuring sound. So measuring sound. Measuring sound is very important for many reasons, one of which is just hearing safety. We need to be able to measure sound and know, is this too loud? Is it going to cause hearing damage? Or, you know, measuring sound as an input into a console, do we have enough sound coming through or is there a problem somewhere? And so measuring sound is very important. And we measure sound using the unit of measurement called a decibel, also shown as just dB. And decibels are a logarithmic unit of measurement. They're not a linear unit of measurement. And that's because the lowest um, and smallest pressure that a human can distinguish is 20 micropascals, which is 0 0.000402. Um, and in comparison, uh, the sound that produces pain to our ears is 20 pascals. But the jet, a jet engine from a plane can roughly produce 630 pascals. Now, pascals are units of pressure, um, atmospheric pressure. So remember, sound is causing pressure, compression, rarefaction. It's causing pressure waves in the air. 
and that is being measured with Pascal's. But if we were to just simply see Pascal's on a linear graph, we would see the smallest at 0 0.0002 and the most, and that's micro Pascal's, all the way at the most of 630. And then everything in between, remember we hear, and it hurts at 20, but engines can produce, jet engines can produce 630. That's gonna be a huge graph. So by using a logarithmic uh, unit of measurement, we can condense that graph into a much more manageable and easier to see picture. And there's also different units of decibels. So you can measure electronic voltages of um, decibels. You can measure the pressure in the air. There's different units. And so you can see dB SPL, which is sound pressure levels. You can see dBV, dBU, dBW. There's all different ones. But I'm going to be simply talking about dB SPL, sound pressure level. And within measuring sound pressure levels using decibels, you can have different weightings. There's A, B, and C weighting. A weighting is um, measuring sound how most, most how we can hear it in our ears. So if you're reading a measurement and it says 90 decibels and it's dBA, then it's going to be really close to what we're going to accurately be hearing, 90 decibels in our ear, which is pretty loud. Now, DBC um, brings up more of the bass response. Um, that's not how going to be we're going to perceive it, but it's going to be more accurate to what's actually happening. And so a 90 decibel response on DBA might be like a 94 decibel response on DBC. Um, so just be aware that there are different weightings when doing sound pressure level measurements. Um, so if you're trying to measure the sound for a room that you're in just to make sure it's not loud, you're fine with sticking with just DBA. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is talk about the inverse square law and how that's really important. But first, I'm going to show an example of the inverse square law. In this example, I'm going to be talking about the inverse square law as it relates to sound pressure waves um, to demonstrate the importance of recognizing um, how sound pressure increases with distance, especially when using a microphone at a sound source. So the inverse square law simply states that sound pressure decreases 50% as the measured distance from the sound source is doubled. So if we're at one inch from the diaphragm of the speaker and move two inches, sound pressure is gonna decrease by 50%. From two to four inches, it's gonna decrease 50% again. Now, if we translate that to decibels, it's gonna be a six decibel loss every measured distance from the sound source that's doubled. So in this example, I'm going to play pink noise out of the speaker. I have measured from the diaphragm 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and over here 32 inches from the sound source. And as you can see in the top right of your screen, I have a decibel meter. And so I'm going to play pink noise. Um, be warned, you might want to turn down your headphones. I'll give you just a second. So I could see there, um, we had about 53 decibels coming from that speaker at that measured distance. So now if we cut that in half, we're gonna increase by six decibels. So we were at 53, so we should be seeing now 59 decibels. So that was just barely under 59, but really close to six decibels. So here we go. We're between 58 and 59 decibels. It's going to move up half, so it's going to go up six. So it's going to be um, 65 decibels, maybe 64 decibels. Here we go. So we got to 63, a little on the low end. We were more at five decibels, but still illustrating the same point. We're gonna half this again. We were at 63. 
hopefully going to be around 69 decibels now. All right, so we got to about 68 and a half, just a half decibel off. So from we'll just round up to 69. From 69, we're going to half that distance again. So 69 plus 6 can be about 75 decibels here. Actually, 76. I'm probably just a little bit too close. So here, half the distance again to one inch. I think my ruler moved just a little bit, but here we go. So we went from about 75 to 80, so about a five decibel increase. This is not precise exact measurements, but it gets the point across. Every time you half the distance, you're going to increase, or as you get closer, you half the distance, you're going to increase six decibels. As you half the, or multiply the distance by two, you're going to decrease by six decibels. Now, this is really important, important when you're miking up sound sources, because just that one, one inch difference from the front is going to make a huge increase in volume, six decibels. So this is really important also for singers. You know, if you're eating the microphone, you're super close to it, and you're going back and forth by just a couple inches, your volume is gonna go up and down drastically. So that's why for and singers, it's very important to just stay at the same distance from the microphone. And so that is a de demonstration of the inverse square law, just showing how um, sound pressure levels decrease and increase as your measured distance is doubled or halved. All right, so hopefully that example gives you a really good idea of how when you measure, when you double the measured distance from a sound source, it's gonna decrease by six decibels. And that's really important, again, for what I saw, what I showed in the example. If you're at a microphone and you come from two inches to one inches, you're gonna have a sec a six decibel increase. So if you're a singer and you're constantly moving your mic back and forth and you're just going all over the place when you're singing, you're gonna have huge differences in your volume. And so being making sure that you're at a steady um, distance away from the microphone is very important to make sure that you have a steady volume. You're not gonna be driving the sound person nuts or the person trying to mix your audio and your recording. It's not gonna be like from quiet to loud. It's gonna be nice and steady. Um, that's also important for sound people in the back. If they're measuring sound from the very back of the room and trying to get an accurate picture of, is this too loud for the audience? Well, it's gonna be much quieter than it is halfway through the audience. It's gonna be six decibels quieter. So if you're at a speaker, you're at the back of the room, halfway in between, it's gonna be six decibels louder. Go halfway in between that, it's gonna be six decibels louder. Halfway between that, six decibels louder. And so to get an accurate measurement of sound, you need to go to where they are and measure from that point. Or if you've already pre-measured and you know the mathematical dif differences, then you can get an accurate assessment of, if I'm back here, that's 100 decibels, but I know the measurements and I've done the math, I know up there it's 120. It's gonna be really, really loud and that's not acceptable. Um, so it's very important to understand how sound is measured and to remember the inverse square law. And so uh, next I'm going to just talk about um, hearing sound, like physically with our ears. Hearing sound. So it's important to understand how we hear sound. We've already talked about some of those when we talk about measuring different, um, measuring uh, sound pressure levels with a decibel meter and how there's different weightings. Um, those weightings come based on how we perceive sound. Um, and so we're going to talk about the ears, but first you can pause the video, go to the link in the description. I'm going to post a video there about how our ears physically work. It's really cool. It has a um, 3D animation that you can really see how our ears work. Um, so stop, take a moment and watch that video.
Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good visualization of how our ears work and how they are transducers. They take one form of energy, acoustic air pressure, and change it to electrical neurons in our brain for us to process. Um, but our brains, our physical ears have limitations. And so first I'm going to start with the, the limitation of frequency hearing, our frequency response of our ears, you could say. We hear between 20 and 20 kilohertz. And as you age, so let's say probably around the age of 30 plus, you start hear, your hearing starts to decrease in those high frequencies. You're not able to hear as much. So somebody around the age of 50 can probably, on average, hear about 16 kilohertz, maybe 17 kilohertz if their hearing's still really good. But plus, beyond that, all the way to 20 kilohertz, it's gone. Um, that's just natural aging of our ears. Um, and then based on our past, our hearing um, damage that we've given to ourselves based on how many concerts we went to or how loud we listen to music in our headphones or for how long, that can also greatly uh, decrease our hearing ability as well over time. But in general, 20 to 20 kilohertz is what we can hear. And the next thing with our ears um, is temporal fusion. That's kind of a limit that we have as well, is that when sounds reach between 10 and 20 milliseconds of the direct sound, so again, direct sound from my mouth directly to the microphone, that initial direct sound, anything under 20 milliseconds after that is just going to be perceived as that kind of elongation. Uh, but remember, early reflections are also in that same realm. But early reflections can really be um, bumped up to around 35 milliseconds. But as soon as you start to get down between 10 and 20, it's different for everybody, it can be perceived as one sound and not necessarily kind of an early reflection. But remember, reverberation is just an elongation of the sound, so it could be okay. Um, that's temporal fusion. Now, the next is the Haas effect. And this isn't a downside or limitation. It's actually... Um, something that's uh, how our brains work that's really good for us. It's the ability to perceive sound and its immediate repetitions coming from the same direction, even if something's louder coming from another direction. So a real-life example would be sitting in a crowded, loud restaurant with your friend. You're talking at a table. You can perceive and hear the sound from them well, even though there might be some music and just a lot of loud noises in the background. That's the Haas effect, and it's just another way that our brain just works very beautifully. Um, another way that our work, our brain and ears work very well is we have binaural hearing. We have two uh, kind of microphones in our head. And so we know that sound travels at a specific rate. And so if sound's coming from one area, it can hit this ear first and then come around and hit this ear second. And because of that time differential, we're able to figure out with our brain, like sound is coming from that direction. And so that gives us uh, the ability to perceive where things are coming from. And that's very important to remember when we're mixing sound in a stereo setting. Like if we're uh, mixing down a, a song and we pan the guitar right or pan it left, like all we're doing is just making time differences so that it's hitting this ear first and then, then this ear, but we're doing it through uh, simulation and computer processing. Um, and it gives us a nice stereo image. The next thing is the equal loudness principle. Um, this is just how um, our, hear, our ears work. We don't perceive all frequencies from 20 to 20 kilohertz. We don't perceive them as the same. So if I were to play a sine wave at 50, kilo, or 50 hertz and then without changing the volume on the speakers, turn the oscillator up and start sweeping all the way to 5,000 hertz, at some point we're going to start to notice hey, this is getting a little bit louder, and it's getting louder, and it's getting louder, and all of a sudden at 5,000 hertz, we're going to say, man, this is way louder than that initial sound. But in actuality, we didn't change the volume in the speakers. That's just how our ears perceive different frequencies. Um, the most sensitive our ears are the most sensitive frequencies our ears are tuned to is the two to 5,000 kilohertz range. And that's because that's where all of our vocal dictation is. That's where um, the difference is uh, when we're talking, the, the T's and the S's and the P's and the, all the dictation, that's where that's at. And it's really so that we can hear each other well. Our ears are tuned to be in communication with each other. And so the equal loudness principle, that's what affects our decibel measurement weighting, which we talked about before. We have D, B, A, B, and C, the different weightings. 
A is more accurate to how we perceive loudness, so it's not going to pick up on those lows as much and put them in that measurement. But C bumps it up to what it's more actually like physically, and it's going to accurately respond to that. So again, when you're measuring sound, using A is fine. Now, another limitation to our brains is called masking. Um, when reverb or repetitive sound sources um, are so close together, they reduce our ability to process the sound and correctly interpret them. So it is kind of like temporal fusion, but there's forwards, backwards, and central um, masking. And you can read more about that in the book. And it's very important to understand these limitations, specifically when we're working with um, mixing music um, and using effects. When we're using reverb and delays and there's timing parameters to them, if we put those parameters too low, then we're not going to get the effect because our ears can't perceive the difference. And um, we need to increase that. At the same time, when we're using noise gates or compressions or something like that, we can use this to our advantage of putting the attack time on some of those so low that our ears are not going to hear the attack of that um, effect initiating because it's so close together. Um, and those are just kind of the psychoacoustic things about our ears. The next thing I'm going to talk about is more of just like a mental state of how we hear sound and how we really when we do that, we listen in two different types of ways. It's critically and analytically. When we listen critically, we're listening for the detail of the sound and the actual and the interactions of the sound through the world around us. You know, like if I record that, I'm listening in the headphones. I'm like, man, how how did the how did the room sound in that recording? Did I hear a lot of reverberations? Did I hear early reflections? Was there enough absorbed in, absorption material in there? Um, that's thinking critically. Uh, also, when putting a microphone on a guitar, like where do I put this microphone? Which microphone do I use? Let me listen to it. Am I getting the most accurate depiction of that guitar into this microphone? That's thinking critically. Analytically focuses on the feeling, sensation, and meaning of the sound. So going back to a guitar example, if you're writing a song and you're playing it and you're like, wow, this, this guitar just doesn't sound right for the feel of the song. I need a guitar that's more mellow, doesn't have as many brights. Or the opposite, like this is a really happy, loud song. I really want a guitar that's bright and projecting. Um, that's thinking analytically. Now, both are very important and they have their place. More often than not, band members think more analytically and sound console guys think more critically, but we both need to have a very balanced approach when thinking that way. Uh, we need to be thinking, you know, is this guitar the right guitar for the song to give that emotion for the song? And if it is, great, you thought analytically, but now if you're not thinking critically and putting the right microphone on there, am I getting the room sound? Am I getting the quality of the sound of the guitar that I need? Then it doesn't matter because you're not going to get the right reproduction of the sound. So you really have to have a good balance of the both. Good balance of both. It doesn't matter if you're in the band or if you're on the sound team. So have a good balance. And then lastly is just hearing safety. Remember, your ears are the most important piece of equipment. They're irreparable. You can have surgery, get these implants and stuff if you lose your hearing, but still, it's never going to be the same. You can't replace it. And so on page um, 15 of the book, there's a diagram there with OSHA guidelines for hearing safety at work. It just gives you a decibel limit and how long you could be there before you can start to hear or experience hearing loss. Um, and then just different... Um, references of how loud things are and so just remember those keep them as a reference for you make sure you're not playing music too loud for too long so you don't lose your hearing and then there's two big signs of hearing loss the first is temporary threshold shift if you've ever been to a concert or someplace really loud for a long period of time and then afterward you were trying to talk to your friend and you're like why are, you, why are you yelling? And you don't understand that you're yelling. It's because you're trying to hear yourself at the same volume, but it's taking more because the little bone in your ear that hits up against the tympanic membrane has physically moved itself away so that it requires more loud sound to move that bone. And it's done as a safety precaution for your ear. 
Um, and so all of a sudden you need louder sounds to hear the exact same way. So if you do experience temporary threshold shift, it means that um, hearing loss or hearing damage is imminent. So you need to quiet things down. Uh, the next is tinnitus, is that ringing in your ear. If you've ever played a video game or watched a movie where there's been war, anytime a grenade goes off, you hear that high pitch ringing. That's tinnitus. Um, and you can get it in your ears after a concert or something like that as well. Um, if you hear tinnitus, there's a good chance that some hearing damage has already occurred and you need to get out very quickly. Um, you want to be able to reduce the volume if you have temporary threshold shift first. Tinnitus is a sign that something has probably already been damaged a little bit. Uh, and so those are the two signs of hearing damage. And yeah, just be safe with your ears. Be safe for other people. Remember that some, some people's ears are more sensitive than others. So just because you can have a one hour time limit at 105 decibels based on OSHA guidelines doesn't mean that you should. Um, and so really be sensitive to the fact that other people's ears are more sensitive and that, you know, you want to protect your ears. So instead of having your service be at 95 decibels, which you can have for four hours, maybe just take a hit and go down to 90 decibels, make everybody happy and be extra safe and protect your ears. And so with that, that's the end of chapter one. Thank you again for watching this video. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that I've talked about, please, you can ask them in the comments below or you can email me. I'll put my email in, in the description and also just like and subscribe to the channel and please share with your friends. Again, I want this to be something that everybody can learn and just easily accessible and free, a free resource for you and your friends. Thanks.